now. There's almost 98% agreement amongst thousands of scientists, which is very rare, that we may only have one generation, 25 years, to turn this around, or we'll have a runaway Earth and humans will become extinct. That's how serious this is. There's so many scientists talking about the bad news of the Anthropocene, but I see the regenerative ag story as unbelievably exciting because regenerative agriculture has some of the best, if not the best, solutions to those seven biophysical Earth systems. So a key factor that's just not discussed behind all that exponential rise of all our modern diseases is what we're doing to our soil. I grew up an only child. My mother died when I was four and a half, so I was left to my own resources pretty well, which was terrific. Five, six-year-old, you go rabbiting with dogs, have the day to yourself almost. And then as I got older, I used to spend a lot of time in the bush. Um, probably 10 or 12, I was quite happy to camp up there on my own. And I ended up going to university after a couple of years at home, working on the farm. So I went off to ANU, did uh, science, but also the first course in Australia and about the third in the world on holistic thinking called human ecology. So both those experiences and education had a big impact. When I, when I uh, had to take over the farm at 22, the best farmers around the district were all into high input agriculture. That meant putting on lots, in this district, lots of fertiliser. Australian soils are very ancient and uh, the soil biology is really clever at rapidly cycling small micro amounts of scarce elements like phosphorus, etc. You put on a huge overdose of superphosphate, phosphorus, and it's just a massive killing off of any soil biology and function. Uh, and then herbicides began to come, you put in pastures, so you'd spray out your healthy grassland, kill everything. You could then just have a few particular species and then you'd pile on the fertiliser. And things were going well, got interested in sheep genetics and then we walked into the four year drought, four plus years of the 79-83 drought. And by then I had a merino stud and I, I said, well, we've got to defend these genetics. So we kept too many animals, had to buy in grain. It was a shocking drought. Got ourselves into debt for the first time and um, built of the landscape. There was a tension then between my love of nature, my biophilia and what I was doing to our landscape. And then by the early 90s, I heard of new holistic grazing movement and did a course. I realised what I'd been doing for, in reality, a couple of decades it had been harming the very thing that sustains agriculture, which is a healthy soil and its systems. I'm a fourth generation merino breeder, grew up on Glenwood and have my wife Pip and five kids who have also grown up on Glenwood. At the time when we took over, the merino industry had just been through a really tough time for prices and the farm and the business was carrying a lot of debt. Pip and I have probably always been inclined to want to manage things more holistically. When we did the holistic management course, we realised that we could change not only our financial situation, but also the risk that we had within the farm, as well as we were able to improve the landscape of the farm over time. So it really appealed to us. There's a lot of talk about uh, regenerative agriculture. The word regenerative is all about renewal leading to uh, greater health in a system. A farm, a paddock, a landscape is a complex adaptive system. A complex healthy adaptive system has within it the solutions to any problem if it's been damaged or simplified. And there's really four biogeophysical systems that operate. There's the solar system that drives everything. That then drives the soil mineral system, the healthy soil biology and the recycling. And then there's the water cycle and system. And the fourth one that's also indivisible is biodiversity. And then I guess when I, I wrote my book and got thinking about farming as a complex adaptive system, we'd missed one ingredient. The fifth one is um, the square foot of real estate. How humans look and handle and treat and understand that farming system. In my case, that system thinking got me to the stage I was almost scared to go out and interfere with this system because I understood its complexity and, its, uh, and the implications of doing the wrong things. There's three basic principles in 
the holistic grazing management. And the first one being that we're only grazing a paddock or an area for a very short time. The second one is that we want to rest it for a very long time so that those plants can recover and any new plants, the seedlings and so on, can establish themselves before they're grazed again. And the third principle is that the animal impact uh, disturbs the soil and allows more plants to germinate and also invigorates those plants as they're grazed to reshoot and regrow their roots underneath the ground as well. We saw the more we got into holistic management that the way we were going was better for our land and we could actually leave our landscape in a better state than when we took over. Where we are on the Monero, we're in a rain shadow from the main mountain range. So on the other side, they'll have a wet winter. And when those fronts come through and the winter turns into snow and we, we don't get much. You know, Australia is the land of floods, fires and, and drought, basically. So we need to have a strategy in place that allows us to manage the drought, both environmentally for our landscape, but also financially. Since we've started managing holistically, the principle is, for us, is that we want to be the last into drought and the first out of drought. We've just come out of a nearly four year drought. Just shocking drought. A neighbour across the front road did what I did in the 80s. Just kept the numbers, they destroyed all the ground cover until the dust started to blow. And so the biology was dead, there was no protection from the sun and the dry and the wind. No water cycle. And then uh, the drought breaker came in July last year. And uh, I said to my wife, Fiona, let's go for a drive. It was about 15, 20 mils into that rain. The neighbour's country is just brown water and mud. It's sheeting off. The, the, the soil couldn't hold any more. Our country wasn't running water. Then I went for a drive when the rain finished. His country was still pouring and we hadn't shed one drop of water. It had all gone in. Now, that, that's no-brainer stuff. I mean, what drives our whole ecology and farming is, is water in ground. We're starting to see, after savage overgrazing and huge rabbit predation, we're now starting to see the succession of those desirable natives increasing. And the natives, as we go into a warmer climate, well, native grasses are adapted to it. So biodiversity is really, um, as I said, this long co-evolved process of ending up with this interrelationship between a whole range of critters, from the biggest to the smallest that we can't see, all in balance to maintain it. I mean, it's, it's fundamental to a healthy agriculture. If we, if we want stable, functioning landscapes that don't erode, that yield this huge plethora of micronutrients and nutrients in our food, we need biology for that. Uh, when I took over management, my father said, about every seven or eight years, we'll be wiped out with wingless grasshopper plague. Instant drought. And that was because it was a simplified landscape. It had been overgrazed, there's bare patches, the wingless grasshoppers lay their eggs. There was no predation on them. And within a few years of us shifting to regenerative grazing, we didn't have any, and we haven't had since, any wingless grasshopper plague. Whereas not far away, they still get them. And so once we've got our, our tree breaks and our patches and mosaics developing at 60, well over 65,000 native trees, many of them seeds off this country, we're starting to see the diversity and spiders' webs and the insects and the birds and all that sort of stuff. By keeping the ground cover and grazing and then getting biological function for pest control with increasing tree breaks and spiders out in the grasslands and all that, and so nature now controls what was once a really devastating regular event. Okay, well, what we're looking at here is uh, one of the iconic grasses of Eastern Australia, kangaroo grass, Themida australis. So all of Eastern Australia would have had this. And prior to European settlement, if you looked across this landscape at this time of year when it's in seed, our landscape would have been orange. But now that we've, through overgrazing and mismanagement, most of this has disappeared, You've now got a white landscape of the inferior, if you like, lower succession native grasses. To me, this is, this is an absolute indicator, like a healthy pulse rate or whatever, of an ecosystem coming back. And, and we're now getting lots of this kangaroo grass re-emerging.
the good regenerative farmers around the world that I've seen, it's not just something you pick up a textbook and you apply. If you're going to become a really good regenerative farmer, it involves a whole worldview change of how landscapes and nature and the earth systems work. True shift to regenerative farmer is a mind and heart process. A, a paradigm, which is a whole construct within your mind and your neural cells, is very powerful. And we all grow up in And to suddenly change and jump ship is not easy and it takes courage and you can be uh, isolated. So I went back to uni and did a PhD in my late 50s, asking that question, what's behind this? this resistance to change, but also why are these regenerative farmers in a totally different paradigm? And so I, I interviewed 80 of the leading regen farmers in Southern Australia, and the key question was, what made you change? And in 60% of the cases, there'd been a major life shock, making them open to new ideas. For some, it was a marriage breakup, others it was burnt in a bushfire, others it was a big drought, it was that sort of thing made them sit down and say, oh, there's got to be a better way or a different way. And in the other 40% of the cases, it had been a series of little incidents, or they were already that way inclined to a more natural way. When we first did holistic management, we were right out there. You know, we were probably frowned upon by the general farming community and they probably thought we were mad. And I'm, I'm sure that that was the case with many people who back in those days started practicing holistic management. Uh, today it's more mainstream and it's accepted by the farming community as something different, but still we're in the minority for those people that manage this way. I think regenerative agriculture now, it's not mainstream, but it's, it's got past, you know, the early phase, the innovators and the early adopters. I think we're into that early majority phase. So we're standing in a paddock here that's called Brines, which is named after my father. On Glenwood, there's been a long history of uh, saffron thistles in particular dominating pasture over the summer period. With the change in our grazing management, we've seen a very visible decrease in the amount of thistles, weeds in the landscape. But after the drought, we've seen them come back with a vengeance, in particular saffron thistle, which makes it very hard for stock to move around and for us to move around in the landscape. In the past, we might have sprayed those out, but today, with our change in the mindset, and what we're trying to do with the landscape, we believe those weeds are there for a, a purpose. So for instance, saffron thistle have a very long taproot, so they're, they're breaking up that ground. They're a successional plant, so they're making, making room and they're creating an environment for better plants to come up behind them. And if you look down here at the, at the soil surface, you'll see that the saffron thistles are now dying and we've got a lot of warrego grass and other native perennials coming up underneath it. The warrigos come back because of our grazing management, but also because we've been able to maintain ground cover, even through what's probably the worst drought in my lifetime we've been through. That's one warrigo plant. Shame you're tearing the roots off underneath it, isn't it? Yeah, I guess why I spend a lot of time writing and talking about regenerative agriculture is that those practices have terrific hugely important implications for both family farms. It makes them more resilient and profitable in my view. And the implications for planetary health and human health are, are also enormous. So my experience of looking at the best regen farmers is that uh, their profitability has gone up. One big reduction that we were able to find was labour efficiency, as well as the way that labour is used on farms. So in the past it was spraying weeds, pasture renovation, spreading superphosphate, ploughing the land, that sort of stuff. Today, we spend a lot of time on livestock management, moving those livestock through the landscape, as well as fencing and subdivisions. The other big cost reduction has been around the inputs that we use, such as superphosphite, chemical and pastures. So we do none of that now. And in, in all of that, our productivity hasn't changed. So we're, we're still achieving the same outputs as far as wool and meat and surplus sheep sales, but our profit is a lot bigger because, and a lot more sustainable year in, year out, because we don't have those inputs. If you clear country, which is what industrial agriculture is based on, you plough or you spray, you can then control what you plant. 
what you're doing is releasing enormous amounts of carbon, not just in the chemicals and the fertiliser, but once you, you clear or spray, you're letting carbon go up because you've killed your plant photosynthesis. So regenerative agriculture is all about having more plants on the ground for as long of the year as you can. You keep pulling that carbon down through photosynthesis. And when you have healthy soil biology, they're the critters that bury that long-term carbon. I mean, that's a, a direct example of where Regen Ag uh, has the best solutions to climate change. But the other aspect that's not talked about enough is the role of the water cycle. Now that what's called the hydrosphere, the amount of the water in the Earth's atmosphere and on Earth and stuff, it's probably about 80% the key player of regulating the planet's cooling. And the more we bear country, put up more carbon dioxide and interfere with water cycles, the more we're, we're, we're negatively affecting the whole water cycle and the cooling potential of what's called the hydrosphere of the planet. So the two big issues of healthy landscapes pulling down carbon and then enhancing the hydrosphere, the cooling effect of the planet. Regen Ag by Country Mile is the best way to address those big issues that are threatening the planetary survival. That, that so-called enlightenment process and then the scientific revolution for all its wonders, all that brilliant thinking and philosophers and stuff, what it did was separate us from Mother Earth compared to an indigenous society whose societies are are usually very sustained and long-living. If you look at the modern human health diseases, in delayed fashion by about 10 or 15 years, they show exactly the same exponential rise. And we now know they are most of the cause of that, if not all the cause, is related to the chemicals we're putting into our food and our body, like glyphosate, we know it gets in, and, and the stripping out of the healthy nutrients that our bodies need, replacing them with only a few simple man-made chemicals. We co-evolved in landscapes to have a huge diversity, of not just your minerals and all your, you know, 90 odd elements, but the tens of thousands of phytochemicals that are in forage plants, which in a healthy landscape, your animals are eating, let alone what the biology is pulling out of the soil. One of the key soil biological factors in a healthy soil are your root fungus. Uh, they're called microhazal fungi. Uh, in, a, in a healthy soil, these guys have a really unique symbiotic partnership with plants. Their part of the bargain in symbiosis is to, is to go off and pull in all the nutrients and micronutrients, hundreds of them, back to the plant. And if that's a forage plant for meat or a crop, those nutrients are into that food. In a healthy cubic metre of soil with root fungus, those feeding tubes of the fungus, bringing all those nutrients, could be 20,000 kilometres of them. If we come along and plough, spray, overgraze, those root fungus go, and you've just got this drug addict dose of a few simple minerals. So a key factor that's just not discussed behind all that exponential rise of all our modern diseases is what we're doing to our soil. So the importance of regenerative agriculture is just you can't even state it. it it's, it's the best solution to our planetary and human health crisis. There's no doubt about it, the understanding that of what industrial agriculture and modern pharmaceuticals and stuff is doing to human health. It's opening up a greater awareness amongst consumers that healthy food off healthy landscapes is the best medicine you can have. I mean, people have only got to taste food that comes from a healthy biology, what the microhazal fungi deliver and all the rest of it, and it's a totally different food. The consumer around the world is now a lot more switched on to the way where their clothes are coming from, where their meat's coming from, where their vegetables are coming from. So there is a general shift in the world around sustainability and, and today regenerative agriculture. Today the wool fibre which is processed into next to skin wear and garments and jumpers and whatever else is probably the only natural fibre when managed holistically, that can regenerate the landscape. People in the, in the city, young and old, can play a role here. You can shift where you can if it's not too expensive to food that's full of you know, organic farms or local food gardens. A really smart, well-researched consumer decisions. And that ap applies to beautiful natural fibre 
like uh, wool off regenerative farms that doesn't use any chemical. Get informed about if you go to one of the big supermarket chains, just how crap some of that food is and it's health destroying. Experiment, even if in a small way, with growing your own and, and go to some of the uh, local food markets, the organics, and just taste the difference. I'm friends from university with some of the leaders in the world systems at ANU and elsewhere who, who work with uh, Stockholm Resilience Centre and the others. And they are, if I can use plain language, they are shit scared about what's coming. And the leaders now, there's almost 90 something percent agreement amongst thousands of scientists, which is very rare, that we may only have one generation, 25 years to turn this around, or we'll have a runaway Earth and humans to become extinct. There's so many scientists talking about the bad news of the Anthropocene, the human made next phase of Earth. But I see the regenerative ag story as unbelievably exciting because of all the solutions around regenerative agriculture has some of the best, if not the best, solutions to those seven biophysical Earth systems. I suppose what we're doing here is a form of regenerative agriculture, but there's so many different ways that people are practising regenerative agriculture out there. What we're doing is practising holistic management, which does promote a regeneration of our landscape. And that's important to us because we want our future generations to be able to come onto Glenwood and have a future, both a financial and a lifestyle future here on Glenwood. And it's also better for our our animals and it's less stressful for us if we manage that way. We, we don't want to revert our landscape back to what it was 200 years ago. We think we can prove on that and we can have, by encouraging a diversity of perennial plants, we're going to have a very diverse flora and fauna landscape. How do I see this farm in 30 years, <clears throat> which I won't see? It's going to be, I hope, quite different. You know, we've planted over 60,000 trees and shrubs into the overcleared grassy woodland. So by then it will be mature and diverse and we would have planted a lot more by then. So it'll look stunning in that respect. Going for a drive, we're starting to see the original beautiful perennial native grasses, kangaroo grasses, starting to come back. I would hope in 30 years, as well as the grassy woodland starting to come back in big mosaics and patches, the grasslands would start to be look predominantly orange and underneath that will be this huge diversity of what was there before with all the function that goes with it.